Good morning, everyone. Now we move on uh, to the first session. Uh, in this first session, uh, I'm Dr. Tai Chuan, uh, the head of neurology uh, and University Medical Center at Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, I'm a moderator today, and I uh, would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Professor Chum Nevers. Uh, he is my co-moderator uh, also. Uh, please, Dr. Nevers. <clears throat> Thank Professor Chen uh, Ngoc Tai and Dr. Uh, Li Ming and President of uh, Vietnamese uh, Society of Neurology. And all of the professor and doctor come from Thailand, Chula Langkorn, and Malaysia, uh, Myanmar, and Laos. Today, I'm very happy to join this event the first time for a uh, conference, uh, Abnormality Movement into China. I think very interesting and I'm very happy and thank you for all uh, doctor and professor to join this event. And on behalf of the president of Cambodia Neurology Association, I will join and closely and our college neurology to join in this uh, movement, abnormality um, movement disorder is very important and closely. And uh, I'm uh, <clears throat> uh, welcome to all ladies and gentlemen to join this event. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, in this first session, we have two topics. Uh, the first topic is uh, results and challenge of movement disorder in Indochina. Now, I would like to invite Professor Ron Roy Biayasari. Uh, professor Ron Roy Biayasari is a professor of neurology and director of Chula Long Kong Center of Excellence for Parkinson's Disease and Related Disorder, Thailand. Uh, professor Biayasari, please. It's a nice start, um, Professor Chan, when we discuss about planning the program, we thought that it how could we, you know, kick off this meeting. So I think that this would be quite a nice topic to begin with. And uh, when I actually prepare it, um, I look at the time, it's uh, got 15 minutes uh, for this topic. So it's really a challenge to talk about the challenge in Indochina in 15 minutes. So it's not easy <laughs> at all. So you already give me the challenge to start with. So, um, but here we are. I think that uh, instead of, I'm going to board you with a lot of statistics about various number uh, about the Indochina, I think that it would be nice to think about these challenges from the patient perspective. So I think that would be, um, the way to do for it. This is my disclosure. And before I begin to that, I like these quotes actually. I tried to repeat it without looking at it for a few times, it's not easy at all. I think that many of you might heard about this quote from Donald Rumsfeld, I think it's 20 years back. Um, so we know there are no knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things that we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. The one that we don't know, we don't know. I think that uh, many of you might heard about that. If you, know, if you chuck off the screen and ask me to repeat that, probably I would not be able to. But um, I think this also reflects to what's happening in, in, in our Indochina in movement disorder, there are many things that we know. And that we, there are many things that we know that we don't know. And there are many authors that we don't even know that we don't know. But I think this is one point that they missed here that uh, they didn't talk about, you know, we don't know that we know. Okay. You know, how to deliver um, um, treatment in movement disorder in Indochina, you know, it, it, it includes a lot of factors, but I try to simplify it. So I think that what is important here, if you look at the patient center, that is what, what we all know. 
is still a basic factor that include the healthcare professionals. We as a neurologist, for example, um, carers, most of the Parkinson disease patients, movement disorder patients have a carer, and also the treatment and medication availability. I think this is three important basic factors that constitute how we deliver, deliver a basic treatment to the patient. And in order to illustrate this, I'm going to take you like uh, one and a half minutes to watch the video of a typical Parkinson's disease patient in Thailand. I'm sure it's quite similar elsewhere, but I think it would be nice to reflect this visually to all of us. You can read the English subtitle. มันจะเอื้อมเอื้อไม่ได้ทั้งกับเพียงอะไรเหมือนอะไรต้องใช้มือกวาดช่วยมือซ้ายตับขึ้นช่วงแรกยังไม่มีผลอะไรเพราะย
part of it might be because that we don't have the data at the moment. And there are many things that we can work around that to have this data becomes available. But I think that you can see that you can expect the burden that's um, going to be concentrated uh, in Asia and the region. I show you this statistic. I'm sure that if you search in the Google, you will find a lot of this. And burden of disease, I show you earlier, reflect by the patient, how they encounter in the video. But in terms of the research perspective, there are different ways to do it because we want to make it quantifiable. And I think that if you look at the disability at just life year, the only figure that I'm going to bore you in this uh, 15 minutes, you can see that um, the number for the Thailand, for example, or the Vietnam, as a two representative of the um, in Indochina, but you can see the Cambodia there and Malaysia. If you put that together, disability, disability at just life here is going to be above 100,000, and that is quite, you know, astounding. And the mortality in our region for the movement disorder patients is quite significant themselves, and you can see it's on these two maps. So, okay. So I'm sure you can appreciate the burden of the disease that the patients encounter in different sorts of way. Patients themselves, the video, the numbers and so forth, mortalities and so on. But look at the resource, what we have available for um, movement disorder patients within our region. This is from the publication that uh, we did together, Professor Tran, um, two years already. And uh, we put in try to find the statistics of the, in terms of the number of patients and the number of the neurologists in the uh, bottom. You can see that we have less than 2000 neurologists within Indochina, but we have above 100,000 patients in Indochina, which again is likely to be underestimated number of patients there. So you can see that our resources in terms of the tackling, um, the movement disorder patients within our, our, our region is, um, is, is very significant. And you know, probably you don't need this figure to make, um, to, for us to realize that uh, our manpower is pretty stretched in terms of the uh, taking care of these uh, movement disorder patients. And I think that this, um, we hope that the number of this figure will change and the increase um, with the further collaboration and so on. And comes down to the last part, which is the treatment availability. When I look at this table, I thought that this table you know, reflects the number of doc doctors and so forth, but they talk about the um, advanced therapy. You know, particularly, you know, we discussed uh, uh, before about the availability of deep brain stimulation uh, within Indochina. I know that you, know, you are one of the uh, pioneer, there are several centers within Vietnam can do the deep brain stimulation. Malaysia can do, Thailand can do, and so forth. But I'm sure that the accessibility for the patients to come to have this kind of treatment um, is not easy. And I'm sure that it's uh, quite a long uh, waiting list there. So that is the scatter of the super niche uh, center that can provide the treatment within Indochina, but um, it's not freely available. But if we look down further a bit more in terms of the uh, medication, oral medication, you know, for the countries in Indochina, you can see some uh, you know difference in availability there. Um, we missed the data from Cambodia, but I think that today we will know the data from Cambodia since we have Dr. Nawut here, and uh, Livodopa, of course, is you know, listed, but again, I believe that it's also not um, um, uh, freely 
available within countries within China. So, you know, we talk about the manpower, we talk about the treatment. I think the last part that we need to discuss briefly is the knowledge of the movement disorder itself. And I think that's why we have the conference like this today. And that brings me to um, the work that we did quite a while back, um, eight years ago now, we actually did the survey on the uh, knowledge of the Parkinson's disease among medical professions. And you can see that is this 26 item, um, there are some gaps in knowledge that you can see. Not only in terms of the diagnosis, I think the challenge part that you can see here is the medication about um, the knowledge of the uh, uh, medication adjustment, the medication treatment, and so on. And I think that this um, conference will serve as a platform for us to share the knowledge and improve the knowledge on how we uh, treat Parkinson's and movement disorder patients. But when I did this, I got the question asked that, are you sure that um, this type of activity that we do together is going to improve the knowledge of the doctors who come here? And, and thanks to our colleagues in Laos, I think that we did this. Um, Apasan, you remember that uh, we did this um, uh, teaching course together uh, in Vientiane and uh, with the support from the Movement Disorder Society. And this is the, the results is pretty clear that following even the one day lecture, um, the knowledge among the participants has improved. So, you know, this is just to say that the, what we do has an impact. Um, and the impact has to be continuous. And the issues of the disparity of the movement disorder conditions is clearly recognized by the World Health Organization. They attend this um, uh, kickoff uh, of the uh, World Health Organization launch on the global disparity on Parkinson's disease. And that is followed by this publication that addresses six important steps to address this disparity. You look at it, you can read it through, but you will realize that each of the step is not going to happen overnight. It requires you know, a lot of effort, groups and so forth. Like for example, lack of epidemiological data, we're not going to have this you know, within um, a stance. So it needs a lot of uh, collaboration to put uh, the effort together to uh, have this uh, data available. And I think that it's very much in need in our region to have this kind of data so we can actually um, implement um, many other interventions. Look at the patient perspective, lack of carer support, to have this platform available to the carer, I think that is also requires a lot of work, requires a lot of team, requires a lot of knowledge to put that together. So how can we do this? I think that we probably are already doing, and I like to use the phrase um, that uh, two heads are better than one. So it reflects the intuition that people working in groups are more likely to come to the correct decision than you know, if we work alone. And I think this is what we are doing right now. We work as a group. This is not two heads, this is a hundred heads. So hundred heads that we have today are going to be much better than one. And we already put two heads together, Professor Tran, uh, for uh, this uh, Indochina Movement Disorder Conference. So what I'm going to end my topic on the challenge in the 15 minutes here, I would like to to end it by that, you know, the, the, the situation nowadays are even more a challenge in the age of disruption. Disruption that we face nowadays is actually a new normal and fundamentally redefine the way that we work, live, see, and manage our patients. So in order to thrive in a digitally disrupted world nowadays, we need to collaborate. I think this is very important. Collaborate amongst our neighbors 
so we can embrace each other to our full potential. But to implement whatever WHO has outlined there, it has to be stepwise. Do whatever we can, small at the time, but we need to think big, big as an action. So, you know, part of it, we're probably not going to be able to improve all the manpower at once. We're not going to be able to make the uh, uh, medication freely available. But I think that now one thing that we can utilize quite quickly is the digital technologies. And this is one way that we can address um, this challenge. And we can utilize digital technology to improve to address our challenge quite quickly. For example, the education that we do now, uh, we do the online education, for example, we do the tele movement disorder visits. And I'm sure that there are many other applications that we can utilize across our region to collect the data and so forth. This is some of the examples. And I want, would like to invite um, the doctors here, whether on site or online, to join this um, educational roadmap. I think this is very useful, it's free to join. Um, you go into this website, you register, and the lots, lots of the um, uh, educational materials are there, and, um, and, it's, and it's free of charge. Some of us already are the ones who contribute some of the lectures here. I think Dr. Chilada did the one on sleep in movement disorder. Um, for example, and this is the uh, QR code that I would like to invite you all to join as a membership of the International Parkinson's Movement Disorder Society. Again, it's free for our member. So it's free to join. You just need to uh, log in, uh, apply, and then you can get access to a lot of information. The membership of the Asian Oceanian section constitutes um, around 30% of the global uh, membership. And I'm sure that we can have more members here. And also we have our educational roadmap uh, within Jula Longkorn Center as well. And uh, you know, I invite you to have a look at them. You can access again um, to this uh, link above and you can join a number of the uh, lectures and activity. So I would like to really end by the world has changed and there is no going back. But uh, we as Indochina, as a group, evolution is a key for our region, not only to survive, but to thrive and to grow. So we need to embrace on the new knowledge, implement new technology for our benefit and collaborate more to advance ourselves forward. So our region needs the strategy to move forward. And I just want to reflect here that, um, as I mentioned before, you know, no one can do everything, but uh, we each can do something. You know, each of us has different strengths and weaknesses. And I think that collaboration would be a good way to work together. We probably cannot improve our weaknesses, you know, in a short time period, but if we work better, we can go forward very quickly. And importantly, if we give more, we can take more. And I would like to end, really end by that. Uh, I hope that this meeting, we will learn fast and we act strategically as, you know, briefly discussed, you know, for the growth of our Indochina in movement disorder and hope that our section will scale up rapidly. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ronroy Bilayasari. Uh, we have uh, some questions for Professor. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, what will you do to improve uh, uh, the knowledge in our region in the future? <laughs> yes, this is, uh, I, I think that we're already doing this, and this is, you know, 
Indochina Movement Disorder Conference is one of the activity that um, um, you know enhance our knowledge. And I'm sure if we do the pre-test, post-test here, you know, we will get the significant results from it. But I think that knowledge is is um, can do in different ways. You know, looking back, you know, when when we talk about this at the opening. To have this conference to join as an on-site or online, it takes months or years to organize. It takes a lot of um, effort, not just only manpower, but also resources and so forth. But I think it's also very important that we could think what we can do in between. And you know, within Indochina, we have already done some. You know, Professor Tran, you have already you know send people and exchange doctors and nurses is one way that we can do it along the way we can do even some online activity before, uh, in in different center within indochina to collaborate um, our knowledge and the online activity i think is the way to go um, at the moment so we can do the periodic um, uh, intermittent uh, knowledge um, activities together and we can start small, start with one university with the others, and then you know, with time, you know, we networking and we will grow more. When I talk to some of the colleagues in this region, some might want some might respond to me like, oh, you know, we in China, we don't have that much of the digital technology, so we cannot do that. We're not advancing as the Western country. But I think in the opposite way, really, because if we are in the China, if you think that how much um, you know manpower that we don't have, uh, knowledge that we're lacking, you need to in, you need if to even you know uh, try to boost digital technology to um, to to our centers in our region, because it is the way that we could um, uh, scale up rapidly. So we cannot do anything that, you know, in a traditional way like before. Um, but I'm sure that, you know, every country, every center have different strengths. And I think that if we join and we try to learn from each other on the strength, I think we will, um, you know, grow up very rapidly. Look at the Ho Chi Minh City. You know, last night I came here, very different from a couple of years ago I was here. You know, I, I remember the MC mentioned that this city is a vibrant, and I, I fully agree it's a vibrant city. Your medical center has grown. So I'm very impressed, by the way. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Bide Yasseri. Uh, your speech uh, gave us uh, important and interesting data about the uh, the epidemiology about the, the uh, health uh, situation uh, relating to uh, Parkinson's disease and uh, or the movement disorder. Uh, I totally agree with you. It, uh, they are very useful. Uh, and uh, the, the, the next step, very important for me is uh, to look at uh, the way of uh, collaboration, of a uh, cooperation between us, the neurologists of the region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Roy, for your excellent presentation. And as again, I would like uh, invite Dr. Jira Stringing to be presentation. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Jira Da Screen Cran, please uh, to talk uh, your topic. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Jira, Dr. Jira Da Stringen from Jolarongkorn University. Um, thank you for having me in this conference, and it's my honor to join this conference. I have to say that it's the, my first time to go outside my country after the pandemic. And after the pandemic, this is the first time of on-site meeting. So a bit excited. <laughs> uh, and for the, at the beginning, I would like to congratulate to our first Indochina Movement Disorder Conference. 
today going to talk uh, the topic of basic of movement disorder phenomenology. I have no disclosure. And let me start with the four patient video. And which one do you think that has a movement disorder? Is patient number one. Number two. So number three, she's described that she has a pain on her right chest toilet and then her uh, her grand her parent noticed that she had a tube on her body, her trunk. And the first one. Okay, let me start with the basic is of the abnormal motor activity. And we subclassified into the four main, four main category of the abnormal motor behavior or abnormal motor activity. And most of them is the movement disorder uh, that we will learn in, from now on for one and a half day. And another category is that quite important and also emergency is the mother seizure. As you can see in the patient number one, she has the tonic chronic jerk and also synchronized with her face that also have a jerky movement and actually spreading along the mother homunculus that we call Jacksonian marsh. But in the first patient is maybe on top of movement disorder on, on her uh, hand. And the second patient is the functional movement disorder patient. She is voluntarily to move her leg repeatedly and try to close her eye with forcefully when the doctor try to open her eyes. And actually she can stop the movement when her daughter pay attention to her. And the third move, the patient is the movement disorder mimics, which usually refer to the group of uh, abnormal motor activity from that cause from other cause, for example, weakness, pain, or other mechanical cause that you can see in the third patient. She has actually has a mass on her right chest wall that make her trunk tilt like that. So what is the movement disorder? The term of movement disorder refer to the group of nervous system or condition that cause that uh, either increase or decrease of movement. Uh, the movement disorder should uh, be involuntarily, but actually it can be voluntarily in functional movement disorder group, or maybe semi-voluntary in sex disorder. Uh, and each movement disorder is called phenomenology. In the order to spot the phenomenology, you need to know the salience or the prominent feature of this move, the movement and how to elicit the feature. And the clinical uh, approach of the movement disorder is uh, a little bit different from the general neurology. In general neurology, we usually start with the problem risk when you can locate the anatomical localization or where is the lesion. But in movement disorder, the problem list we will define as the phenomenology. Uh, and as very important to define the phenomenology of movement disorder to get yourself to into the nature of the, the patient and the movement. And uh, the, then when you know the, the phenomenology and then you will have the knowledge of each phenomenology and then you can uh, further approach to the problem of the patient. And then the tech 
to the next step is uh, what is the reason, which is the crew to determine the cause of the, the phenomenology that you can identify what is the reason. The clinical cause of the, uh, the problem is like, for example, acute onset, you will think about the vascular in origin, subacute might be inflammation, like uh, either infection or non-infection, and the chronic might be things about the neurodegenerative. And in addition to, uh, apart from the phenomenology and etiology, the movement disorder usually has a syndrome that you have to know. So these are the information that you should get to know to approach one patient with, with uh, abnormal movement disorder. First, uh, as I will talk in 30 minutes, is the phenomenology categorization and what to determine of each phenomenology. In general, we determine the form of the movement disorder, velocity, spontaneity, or when it occurs, distribution of the movement, the temporal association, and one patient can have more than one movement disorder. So maybe you identify the major or the, the prominent feature of the abnormal movement. Then go to the general history taking. And additional, you should get the family history the, to identify the mode of interretain, peri and perinatal history, also drug or substance uh, exposure, and then the clinical cause, as I told you before, and then keep all the information to be the syndrome or not. Okay, we subdivide, uh, as I told you, that we have an increase or decrease of movement. So we call the increase of movement or excessive of movement is hyperkinetic movement disorder or hyperkinetic disorder. And for the decrease or reduce of movement is hypokinetic disorder. And in the hypokinetic group, there some can be referred to a kinesia, hypokinesia, or bradykinesia. Sometimes it used overlap. And uh, some literature try to propose the definition of each uh, term, which a kinesia is the loss of movement, the hypokinesia is the decrease of amplitude of movement, and the bradykinesia is the slowness of movement. Um, but uh, in uh, clinical practice, some clinicians refer this group as a Parkinsonism that you will learn in the next topic in depth. And also this is the example of the hyperkinetic movement disorder. So let me start a little bit with Parkinsonism. And the Parkinsonism is a syndrome, it's not uh, like a group of phenomenology, it's not the disease and it's not equal to Parkinson's disease. And as you can see in this picture of Parkinsonism, this combined of the Brady kinesia is the main symptom of Parkinsonism and rigidity, rest tremor, postural instability, bracing, and also fake posture. Having two out of six is the defy of Parkinsonism, and one should be Brady Kinesia. So, Brady Kinesia is the slowness of initiation with progressive reduction in speed and velocity. So, we call it decrement of movement or decrement of amplitude and the, rapid, the velocity of movement. You can test this by the repetitive, repetitive movement, for example, the finger tapping or alternate hand movement or foot tapping that we, I have a little bit video to show you. And note that the toe tapping is more sensitive than the heel tapping. And also you can evaluate the body kind of say in many ways, such as handwriting, spiral drawing, voice, and also facial analysis, which also the clinical presentation of the body kind of say. And This video showed the Parkinson's disease patient with a decrement of the amplitude and velocity when she performed the finger tapping test. 
let's move to the rigidity. And rigidity is the increase the, of the resistance to the slow passive movement and velocity independent. So the, this making the difference between uh, rigidity and spasticity because spasticity is the velocity independent, dependent, sorry. So, uh, so rigidity needs a much, much more slower passive movement to test it with this different from the spastic city. And when you feel the tone of the rigidity is the constant of the increased tone, which is different from spastic city. And sometimes patients might have a tremor super uh, imposed on top the the rigidity and you will feel the, the cock wheeling, the, uh, the like a rhythmic increase of tone. So it's called cock wheel rigidity. But uh, only tremor without true rigidity, when you test the, the movement, you can find the rhythmic of the tremor. So it might be uh, not the true rigidity, but it's only the tremor is called cock wheeling. As I mentioned, this is not the true rigidity. For the next one is the rest tremor. The rest tremor in Parkinsonian is one of the key is to fully support the body part that you want to test in. This is one of the example. We press the patient hand on their left. And the classic is around four to six hertz and predominant address, and also AB and A deduction. We also test the other component of tremor, like this is the postural tremor. And this also another position that you can test the rest tremor to make it fully relaxed. And you have to observe maybe at least or up to 30 seconds if you cannot see the tremor because sometimes it's waxing and raining. And if you cannot see at the immediate or spontaneous, you can perform the cognitive tasks, for example, serial subtraction, backward count, and the tremor can be illicit. And if your chair has an armchair, you can press the arm of patient on the armchair. And this also the classic stool posture of the patient. He also have a rounding shoulder, arm and elbow flexion, my hip flexion, and also knee flexion. And the last one is the postural instability and gait disturbance. The with is the loss of confidence on their feet and feeling imbalance like a rectal portion or proportion. And you can test by asking the patient to stand out of the chair without support. And other test is the pull test. And for the gait, uh, characteristic are usually on slow speed, narrow base, short step, on block turning, and sometimes with freezing of gait that we will have another session of gait examination and disorder. And the facing phenomenon is the uh, transient phenomena of the abrupt of the gait. Like this, this video showed the facing of gait when he initiated to start walking. The second, in, when he turning, he have a short pause and cannot and the last one is also occur during walking. So after you know the Parkinsonism, you can classify it according to the etiology into the four main category like idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which is the most common cause of Parkinsonism. The other like secondary cause Parkinsonism plus and also corridor degenerative. Okay, let's move to the hyperkinetic movement disorder. And uh, for the clinical approach in general, you might recognize the hyperkinetic 
the phenomenology like first when you see the patient immediately you should look at whether the movement is rhythmic or non-rhythmic sustain or non-sustain paroxysmal or continuous or uh, when it occur like awake or sleep or in board the next step is when you have a longer observation uh, you can observe the movement like it, it occur at rest action or have an overflow is it pattern or non-pattern or the combination of the various movement and the third step is very longer than the second step is you can be identify other supporting symptom or sign like uh, for example exempt like speed amplitude uh, eye movement cell mutilation something like this is the general scope for the approach but in different patient you can take uh, alternate step and this is the common hyperkinetic movement disorder as you rhythmic movement is the uh, the classic clinical characteristic of the tremor and in the non-rhythmic group the sustained group is the we should think about dystonia and in the non-sustained group we subdivide into non-suppressible and also suppressible in non-suppressible the most common is chorea and myoconus and the suppressible the most common is thick so let's start with the tremor, which is the common hyperkinetic movement disorder. The tremor is defined by the is the definition is the rhythmic sinusoidal oscillation movement of body part due to the regular contraction of the reciprocal in the weighted muscle, either synchronous or alternating. And also subclassification of the tremor refer to the resting and action and also action tremor can divide into the postural and kinetic tremor. The postural tremor, which is the tremor uh, occur when the body part is great against the gravity and the kinetic tremor is the tremor occur with the activity. So this session I gonna cover not in depth of the clinical approach because we have a separate uh, session about how to examine the hyperkinetic movement disorder. So let's start with this first patient. I have an answer. I want to ask you what is the answer of this patient. He, uh, she has the hyperkinetic rhythmic oscillation, as you can see, of bilateral hand, arm, and also when she performed the postural and also kinetic. And she also has a tremor rhythmic on her arm, sorry, her head, and actually her voice. And she has a severe tremor when she pouring the water when writing the spiral. And you will see the axis of the tremulous light is shaking when she's performed the spiral test that she has the essential tremor. And the spiral test usually equal in the, in the shaking characteristic. For the essential tremor, it uh, usually by model at the onset in the second and the sixth decade, and usually has an action and postural, postural and kinetic tremor around five to twelve. Then usually bilateral, and maybe involved in hand, foot, head, and also voice. And, uh, they might have a common family history in the AD transmission. So. The next one is the dystonia. Dystonia is defined by sustained or intermittent muscle contraction, causing an abnormal and often repetitive movement of posture or board. And dystonic movement are typically pattern and sometimes twisting and maybe tremulous on top of the dystonia. So this is uh, important 
is the combination of the movement and abnormal posture. So if you only look for the only constant abnormal posture for dystonia, you might uh, may be under the diagnosis of the dystonia or misdiagnosed to be other problem. And the movement usually have pattern that I talked before is usually repetitive and predictable movement when you observe patient long enough. And uh, sometimes it might be rhythmic or tremulous on top of the dystonia. And this is the example of patient with generalized dystonia. You will see that she has a sustained and sometimes intermittent contraction of her face, her neck, and also make her head twitching. And when she's, and you will see that her hand also has a dystonia, an abnormal posture too. So she has a generalized dystonia. When you see the patient of dystonia, you can uh, approach into two axes according to the consensus of movement disorder society. The axis one is the clinical characteristic. The axis two is the etiology. Actually, this axis we can apply to other movement disorder too. For the axis one, uh, this slide shows the uh, clinical characteristic of, move, of dystonia. The first one, according to the age of onset, the body distribution, which dystonia can present only in one part with its focal uh, or as a segmental, or uh, as in different, it's called multifocal, or uh, in general, like with or without leg involvement. And the Hemi body is quite important because if you see the patient with hemi, the problem something is might imply that you have to look for the contralateral structural lesion. Oh, so, and the third one is the temporal pattern, which is include the clinical cause of the dystonia, like a static or progressive and uh, variability which is present or not like uh, persistent action uh, specific. Is, is it diurnal, which is some dystonia doesn't come out in the morning and come out in the evening or afternoon. As you may know that this is the character of the DOPA responsive dystonia. And the other dystonia is my paroxysmal, which is mean the patient usually have a normal or uh, different in between uh, the episode of the dystonia. Also in the axis one, you have to uh, emphasize the associated feature which is important. You may remember the old term of uh, dystonia as a primary or idiopathic dystonia. In this new classification, we emphasize dystonia as an isolated feature with only tremor around to occur together with dystonia, is isolated dystonia in the old term, or the, or the dystonia have a combined with other movement disorder, for example, Parkinsonism, or not only movement disorder, is it maybe might combine with other neurological disorder, also have to consider in the axis one. So for the axis two, we consider the etiology. It can be uh, divided into nervous system pathology and also uh, you have to do consider of integrated or acquired. So the third one of the hypokinetic, hyperkinetic movement disorder is chorea. Chorea is the irregular, flowing, non-stereotype, random, involuntary movement that process some, sometimes like a rating quality of movement. So the chorea might be equal to random, it's random in muscle affected at random at time or random of activity of duration. Okay, you will see the example of the general like Korea. You will see the flow like or uh, 
an irregular movement and non-pattern. It's different from dystonia. For the dystonia, when you observe for a long time, it may be repeat of the pattern, but the classic chorea is like the flow line and don't, don't not repeat of the movement. This patient has a diagnosis of Huntington disease. Yes. In the face, in, in finger, and the gait of Korea sometimes quite bizarre or irregular gait, and you might be misdiagnosis of the functional movement disorder in choreic gait. Okay. Let's move to the barism. What is this? The barism is the variant of the chorea on the extreme end of the chorea spectrum. It's particularly in the proximal joints, usually in the large amplitude with the frimping movement. Most usually, usually in hemibody distribution, which we call hemibarism and hemichorea. Because I told before that we have to think about the contralateral structural region. In balism, we might think about the contralateral striatum or subthalamic nucleus that associated. I will show you this old lady with a cue onset of the website hemibarism. You will see that she has a quite white olin on her left arm and leg with like the chorea movement, but very high amplitude and uh, more aggressive. At the beginning, her blood sugar was 350 milligram per deciliter, and she has the uncontrolled diabetes. And her diagnosis is the hypercalcemic chorea, which is usually present in hemibody balism chorea. So, the next one is myochronus. For the myochronus is the movement character by, characterized by brief, intermittent, and shock-like jerky movement. Uh, the classification of myochronus might be classified according to the clinical and physiological. For the clinical uh, presentation of myochronus is most often and rhythmic or non rhythmic but less common is can be sometimes rhythmic form. It might be in focal, segmental, multifocal, or generalized when they involve body uh, one more than one body region. And the question that you have to ask yourself that the movement is asynchronous or synchronous, and when the all body parts uh, are jerky simultaneously or not. And at the movement occurring spontaneous without trigger or at all, or at the reflex in many different trigger or as a second, or, or sorry, sensory stimulus, for example, touching the limb, right light or loud sound that can trigger the, uh, the myochronus. Finally, the importance of the myochronus is uh, uh, it can be uh, uh, more, more present when you move your, your body part and you will see that the fast jerky movement can interfere the smooth movement when, when the patient move their body part. And in contrast to the other movement disorder, the erectile physiology is important to access the myochronus. The origin of it can define the origin of the myochronus from the electrophysiology. And uh, it might be come from the contralateral, motor cortex, brainstem, or sometimes segmental of the brainstem or spinal, or multi level of the spinal, which is the proprio myochronus. And for the proprio spinal myochronus, sometimes, but not always, is considered as one of the functional movement disorder. Uh, as an, another origin might be of the myochronus, might be come from the peripheral in origin too. So 
this video show the patient you can describe like a hyperkinetic non rhythmic jerky movement of the distal hand when they outstretch his hand and characterized by partial laps, which is the classical uh, presentation of the negative myoclonus. And the second patient that has her, her hand, which is the sensory stimuli that can make the myoclonus happen. And move to the fourth patient. <laughs> she has a quite weird and brief jerky movement, like uh, with together with a vocalization that responds to stimuli. She has a lata, and we have a nice review from Dr. Tian Lim Tian Tian that what is the lata. And the latter is the culture-specific syndrome characterized by exaggerated startle response. It might be together with uh, echopraxia, corporaria, false obedience, uh, maybe involuntary vocalization in response to startle. The latter is quite culture-specific and also uh, initiate. Uh, First described in our region, in Malaysia and Indonesia. And, and that's, in addition is the various combination between the movement disorder, vocalization, psychiatric move manifestation, and also behavior. Okay. And the last one is thick. Takes is the is defined as the intermittent repetitive stereotype and with premonitory sensation and sometimes it can be partially suppressible. As you can see, ticks are when uh, uh, they also have a repetitive, repetitive intermittent and very stereotypic of movement. In one patient, they have, might have multiple pattern of tick, not only one. And the, each movement will repeat over and over again. With the premonitory sensation is like the urge to perform the tick. So they are the might be volitional component, but actually they don't want to make the ticks in obviously. So they try to suppress the ticks for some period and then it will have the, they will have an urge to move again, to make the tick again, and this is come over and over. And ticks may either motor or movement and or sound, which are motor and we call motor ticks and vocal ticks. For the ticks, uh, it's most commonly in brief, abrupt, and in chronic pattern, but um, we may find the tick in slow pattern and sometimes prolonged. So the term is the tonic or dystonic ticks, which can apply to the quite longer uh, duration of each, each movement. So in addition, we subdivide ticks into simple and complex. For the simple model ticks, is mean the movement involves only one group of muscle and for the simple vocal tick is the simple style without the, the articulation. And for the complex model ticks, which is the movement that has to coordinate the sequence of the movement is involved many parts of, of the muscle. And for the complex vocal ticks is the like a linguistic meaningful utterance. And one thing that important for the text is the characteristic of the text might be semi voluntary movement because they have the urge or the premonitory sensation to move, to have to move or have to make the, the voice. And sometimes it might be uh, look like functional movement disorder too. 
And in addition, text might be distractible and suggestible that also found in the movement, uh, in functional movement disorder too. And this is the example of the type of premonitory phenomena. They might describe that they have to urge or have anxiety or some, some pain, something want to, to move or to have a vocal. And it usually defined in the upper body part. And this is the example of the ticks. You will have the repetitive movement on his face, like repetitive blinking, sometimes shrugging eyebrow, his mouth. And actually he, he has a simple vocal cortex too. And he has this movement from maybe the age of 15. And he was diagnosed with the Tourette syndrome, which is the combination of multiple motor tics and vocal tics. And it uh, usually starts in adolescence and uh, before the age of 18 and do not have other secondary cause. And this is a summary of the general feature of hyperkinetic disorder. In addition to, I talk about rhythmic, non-rhythmic, irregular, sustained or non-sustained in the most common move, hyperkinetic movement disorder. Actually, we have a lot of other uh, move, hyperkinetic movement disorder. For example, in the sustained group of hyperkinetic movement disorder. I will show you the example of the stiff person patient. And she is the old woman with acute onset of the slow speech and steady gait and with severe body stiffness with progressive. You will see that she has a marked stiffness of her axial, her leg, and sometimes superimposed with myochronus, but did not show in this video. In this video, it's really stiff, like um, wooden, and her neck is hyperextension. She was diagnosis of stiff person syndrome is also other hyperkinetic movement disorder. And another aspect that's also important is uh, you have to I didn't consider that movement disorder occur during early daytime or during sleep or in both of time. Let me show you a little bit. And this old woman, she have a feeling of discomfort in her leg when she stay in bed in the evening time and need to move to relieve the sensation. Do you want to try to think about what the diagnosis of this patient? Yeah, I think you know that she has the restless leg syndrome. And the other one is the also nighttime movement disorder. It's not working. Okay. He is about 60 years old man. And his wife complained that he has an abnormal movement during sleep, especially in, in the early morning or second half of the night. And sometimes he shouted. You will see the jerky movement on her on his leg, trunk, and with vocalization. And the uh, EEG and EMG also show that he in the REM sleep stage, which is the evidence of rapid eye movement. And without, without the EMG, 
but when he has the motor activity, this increase of the EMG activity during the REM sleep. So he is the diagnosis of REM sleep behavior disorder, which is one of the uh, prodromal symptom of the Parkinson's disease. And, and for the other feature that you should get to know to, to approach the other uh, feature like uh, the eye movement, the eyelid, hand and neck movement, get cognitive, facial, voice, and also uh, stand and posture to get the whole information to approach one patient with one phenomenology or one movement. So before I end of my talk, this is uh, a little bit take home message that you have to identify this is through abnormal movement and what is uh, the phenomenology that you can spot from the patient and you can classify the movement disorder, the phenomenology and the clinical, some clinical assessment of movement disorder. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Girada, uh, for a good presentation of the topic movement disorder phenomenology and all our form of uh, Parkinson's disease and uh, dyskinesia and about the stages of uh, the axis one or axis two. Axis one is very important for history taking and physical exam. Uh, and axis two for etiology clearly and with video presentation. Thank you. Any question or any comment, please?